neuroscience now tells us more about the mind than philosophy. Or maybe if we modify it, it might or may well or will tell us more about the mind than philosophy. In other words, can neuroscience settle philosophical debates about the mind? But let's um, begin at the beginning and introduce the panel. Uh, Margaret Bowden, on my left, is Research Professor of Cognitive Science at the University of Sussex. The New York Times says she is at the forefront of efforts to exorcise Cartesian superstition. Stephen Rose, on my right, is M. Emeritus Professor of Neurobiology at the Open University and author of The Making of Memory. And Barry Smith, uh, on the far left, is Director of the Institute of Philosophy at the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. Neuroscience uh, can, in principle, and already has in a few cases, made philosophers who are prepared to listen think again and perhaps change some of their views um, about the mind. And I suppose one of the examples of that is the experiments on split brain, where you cut through the corpus callosum, which uh, connects both sides of the brain, and uh, you find that you get uh, behavior rather like a, a split personality, and you're the one side of the body not knowing what the other side is doing, and so on and so on. So certainly I don't want to say that even current neuroscience um, is irrelevant to philosophy. But I think that current uh, fad in neuroscience of brain scanning, brain imaging, is almost totally irrelevant. And what's more, not only irrelevant to philosophy, I actually think it's of uh, almost no scientific interest whatsoever. Now, I, I think it's uh, brain scanning. It's mostly uh, non-scientific fishing expeditions, trying to find correlations between psychological events, like, I don't know, thinking about God, for example, or whatever it may be, um, psychological events on the one hand, and brain events on the other hand. And sometimes they appear to find such correlations. But there are two very big buts, even if they find the correlations. The first is they don't know what they're correlating in the brain because um, they're getting at, for example, both excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. So neurons that are antagonistic in their functions. So all they can say is, this part of the brain is buzzing, but just exactly what's going on, they have no way of saying. I'm not saying this will always be true, but certainly with the current technology, I think that's true. But there's a bigger but, a second but, which is that these are what I called non-scientific fishing expeditions. They aren't driven by theory about what's actually going on, about what the brain is doing, um, about, if you like, what are the psychological uh, functions that the brain is is uh, making possible. I once actually said this, I said to uh, Chris Frith, who was one of the first, and in my view, one of the very, very best people in, in brain imaging, and um, I said to him, well, you know, saving your presence, Chris, I said, I think 95% of the brain scanning stuff is a complete waste of time, um, in the terms that I just said. He said, no, 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 98 <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, so, I think they're doing natural history. Uh, one of these days, and I don't think it's going to be soon at all, one of these days it may be possible for people um, thinking more theoretically about these matters to fit these correlations, and of course lots of other correlations which we will then have, in, much as Darwin was able to fit in hundreds of... of uh, well, thousands of natural history facts which people, including himself, had been collecting for years into the theory of evolution and make it part of the evidence and use it scientifically. Before then, it had been just natural history. So I'm not saying natural history is a waste of time, but I'm saying it's a different matter from science. Most of my neuroscientific colleagues are actually committed to the view, indeed, the mind is the brain, there's a sharp reductionist position in which minds are to be reduced to brain, um, nothing but the froth, or nothing but one of Maggie's f philosopher colleagues calls folk psychology, 
which can be replaced, as she wants to argue, by the concept of a computational brain. Now, some of what she said I agree with. That is um, that the brain imaging stuff is, if you like, I would put it an internal phrenology. That 98% of it is irrelevant is probably true for most of the scientific papers that are published throughout the world today. And a lot of it is irreproducible as well. But that's not the point I want to make. I want to disagree both with my neuroscientific colleagues that the mind is the brain and with what Maggie has just said in relationship to the computational brain. I do not think that either minds or brains are computational. We are not digital systems. We are at best analogic systems and not computable in the way that Maggie is talking about. I want to argue that we need our brains in order to have minds, in the same way as we need our legs in order to walk. But we do not say, our legs are walking, we say, I am walking. We do not say, or we should not say, our brains are thinking. We should say, I am thinking and using my brain in order to think. That the brain is a necessary organ so far as thinking, so far as minding is concerned, I take completely for granted. Otherwise, I wouldn't be a neuroscientist. I wouldn't be trying to understand the brain processes that go on during a whole lot of thinking activities, during learning, during memory, and so on. But I do not think that the activities of learning, thinking, minding, and certainly being conscious are reducible to brain processes. And let me explain why. I've already said because, I, because it is I, the self, which is doing these activities with our brain. But I want to go further. It's not just that brains are embodied, um, they are located in a living human being, but bodies and brains are embedded in the social and cultural world in which we live. And because they are embedded in the social and cultural world that we live, the activity of minding, and here I go along with the philosopher Gilbert Ryle, who said that you should not use mind as a noun, but you should use it as a, as a verb. It's an activity. Minding is what is going on in the conversations between us on the panel, in the discourse which is going on between us and all of you. And mind is therefore a social phenomenon. It's almost a collective phenomenon. Our minds are constituted by, certainly by biology, certainly by our evolutionary history, certainly by the fact also that we live in particular societies, in particular cultures, and particular times. That is, I do not think that the 21st century mind is the same as the uh, 19th century mind or even the 20th century <coughs> mind. Minds are profoundly changed by the society and the technology in which we live. I'm one of those unfortunate older people who is um, not a digi-native but a digi-immigrant. And I'm quite convinced that the minds of my, not just my, my grandchildren but also my children who brought up in a digital age are different from mine in ways which are constituted both by brain processes and both, both by the social culture and technology in which we exist. Here's the worry, I think, for philosophers and probably for all of us. The worry is that um, there are certain things we are interested in explaining. What it's like to be conscious beings, what it's like now to see me and hear me, to be enjoying your moods and feelings and emotions. And people who are interested in that, the nature of experience, they're worried that uh, when they turn to neuroscience, instead of having that explained, that neuroscience might change the subject. So instead of saying, you know, what's it like to see a familiar face, it'll just tell you about the workings of the visual system and how we recognize movement and color and we detect change. So there's this worry that when you turn to neuroscience, if you're asking a philosophical question, you might be changing the subject. Now here's the heresy from my point of view. We need to change the subject because quite often philosophers are starting with common sense ideas that are wrong and misleading. So for example, in the field that I work, we started off taking our theories of perception and the way we explore the world is based on the idea that we have five senses. Why do we think we have five senses? We've got far more than that. I mean, just, just for one, just think you've got a sense of balance. Without that, your experience will be very different. Now, Aristotle gave us the talk of five senses, and it's been preserved till now. But if you ask neuroscientists how many senses have we got, they say anywhere between 22 and 33. 
Well, we've come towards...